What are the barriers that keep us from being consistently generous? And how do we make sure that our generosity doesn't create unhealthy dependency as we meet the real needs of our community? Join me as we take a look at Acts chapter 4. Welcome to week six of our series. We've entitled Seven Rhythms of a Resilient Faith. We're going through the first six chapters of the book of Acts, learning how the early church began to embody the rhythms that Jesus taught them. Sometimes we call them disciplines, sometimes we call them habits. These rhythms help build them a resilient faith. Resilient being the ability to recover quickly from setbacks or adversity. The early church had to be resilient because they were up against a lot of things, persecution, lack of funding, being outnumbered, and ultimately they were up against the devil who never wants God's church to advance. But we've talked about how they learned to be active in sharing their story, how they learned persevering prayer. They celebrated in worship, they engaged with scripture daily, and they served the needs of their community. These disciplines gave them resilience. The sixth rhythm I want to talk with you about today is the rhythm of sacrificial generosity. My dad used to always tell me growing up, and still reminds me to this day, you can't outgive God. And I didn't really understand what it meant. It was an easy phrase to remember, and he'd say it all the time. I knew it meant that God always gives you more than you could ever give back to him, but I didn't understand why this was the point that both he and his Sunday school teacher Albert Landers kept hammering home. It took me many years of walking with Jesus to come to this revelation on my own. And the first is that there's a spiritual revelation that you have to come to, that, that God has given me in Christ Jesus far beyond anything that I could gain on this earth, that Christ has given me forgiveness, salvation, spiritual gifts, eternal life, that I can never give God more than I have received through his son and from his spirit. He's a good, good father as we sing. Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 8, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. So when I had this spiritual revelation of what Christ sacrificed for me, it made me realize that any gift or sacrifice that I could make would pale in comparison. And that's the kind of revelation where you have to ask God to open the eyes of your heart to be able to grasp the depth of his love. This is a revelation that doesn't come academically. It, it happens spiritually. Jesus says you have to be born again to see the kingdom of God. God has to remove the scales from your eyes so that you can see your sin in contrast to God's grace. So there's a spiritual revelation that you can't outgive God, but there's also practical revelation. And this comes by actually obeying his word, by putting God first in all things, including in your finances, to put that into action. You know, generosity is one of those subjects that's easy to understand, but it's difficult to apply. And if we're not careful, we can easily become the lawyer questioning Jesus that led Jesus to share the Good Samaritan. The lawyer wanted to exegete the word neighbor. Who is my neighbor? Let's commission a study. Let's do some focus groups. Let's send some, uh, do some polling data. Let's create a master class. Let's read six books. Let's talk to the top experts. Let's do all this qualitative and, and quantitative research. You, you know, we, we really need to make sure we know what Jesus meant by neighbor before we take any action. But the reality is the issue is not the word neighbor. It's that many of us are educated beyond our level of obedience. Jesus wants us to literally just embrace our neighbor, not become a Pharisee who talks about loving our neighbor but doesn't actually do it. You know, we often can make things a lot more difficult than they really should be, not because we lack understanding, but because we don't really know if we want to do what we're being asked or commanded to do. Our, our many words are, are just a way of us avoiding the need in our midst. 
The reality is that you can only experience true joy by actually obeying God's words. Like the hymn says, "'Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take him at his word." So we need to pray that even this sermon today is not just some intellectual exercise, but that it leads us to make some really important decisions that affect how each of us spend our time and money. The question is, what stops us from being generous? There are many personal forces, which we'll talk about today, but there's also a larger force. Satan, who's the enemy of God, does not want you to be generous. We see in this section in the book of Acts, where uh, starting in verse 31 of chapter 4 today, that Satan is staging a counterattack. And it, it's actually it started before this passage. We see in Acts 2, the Holy Spirit comes in power. Thousands are saved and baptized. And you know, whenever God is at work, you better believe that Satan is nearby, disguising himself and planning a wicked counterattack. And he, he, he counters God's activity in three main ways. The first is we see it Pentecost, uh, that the Holy Spirit comes, but it's followed by physical persecution, that the enemies of God are using physical violence to try to crush the church, locking people up, and soon we'll see that they'll kill them for testifying to the good news of Jesus. And then in Acts chapter 5, we see Satan attacks the church through moral compromise. Ananias and Sapphira, Satan enters someone like he did Judas enters them, convincing them to contradict their values. You know, if, if Satan can't destroy the church externally, he'll, he'll bring the threat internally. And then we see in Acts 6, we see the subtle but powerful attack of what John Stott calls professional distraction. The apostles are tempted to forsake the ministry of prayer and the word to take care of the growing needs of all the widows. And some of the widows are being overlooked and it's risking turning into a racial conflict. And Satan wants to use this very important issue that must be addressed to distract the apostles from the spiritual oversight that they must have in the church. Because if the enemy can get pastors professionally distracted with a Martha-like spirit and trying to solve every need in front of them, then they will take their eyes off protecting the flock from every wind of false doctrine. So the enemy wants to distract us with important things so that we lose sight of the one main thing. So so God is at work in the book of Acts, but Satan is as well. And it's no different today. Satan does not want the gospel to advance in your heart or in your home or in this church. Acts 4.31 starts, it says, After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. Before we can jump into the fruit of generosity, which is awesome, that they shared all things in common, they sold their possessions, which we'll see in a minute, the question is what led them to do this? It it, it wasn't some institution or government agency forcing the early church to share all things in common. It was the Spirit of God that filled them with the presence of God that caused them to lose their grip on the things of this world. It says that they spoke the word of God boldly. They, they weren't concerned about their reputation. They weren't concerned about getting locked up or separated from their families. They were on a mission. And it says in verse 32 that all the believers were one in heart and in mind. Unity is not something that we create. It's something that we protect. We've talked about this before, that Jesus is the one who creates the unity in a church. It was his idea. And he's the one that has the power to bring us together across all of our differences and give us one heart and one mind. But our job is to protect the unity that God has already accomplished. That's why Paul writes in Ephesians 4 to make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. And so the early church is filled with the Spirit. They are of one heart and one mind. And it says no one claimed that any of their possessions was their own but they shared everything they had. This is what our Kenyan friends, uh, my my Kenyan friends, uh, call having fridge rights. You know, where someone's a true friend when when they can eat anything in your refrigerator. Or, you know, you give somebody car rights. They can borrow your car anytime. Or you give them house rights. They can stay at your place anytime. Some of you uh, give other people clothes rights. You, you, You borrow each other's outfits all the time. 
I mean, if the world can have this sharing economy with Uber, Airbnb, and Rent the Runway, I think we should be able to have this sharing economy as a church as well. The question is, what keeps us from sharing our possessions? What, what keeps us from opening our homes? Jesus takes this topic of, of money head on. It's one of the most talked about subjects in the Bible and especially in the Gospels. Jesus understands how this obsession with the material realm can cause real moral compromise. He says famously, no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Why? Because they make competing claims. They they take you in different directions. And you simply can't go in two directions at the same time. It's impossible. You just like you can't be in two places at once. Trees cannot be attached to two stumps. You cannot cook two different meals in the same pan. You don't have more than one heart. And Jesus says you cannot serve both God and money. They make complete, competing and contradictory claims. You have been redeemed by Christ for a mission that is much bigger than what you can see, smell, or touch. I love how uh, C.S. Lewis says it in Mere Christianity. He says, if I find in myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. So you were made for another world, but the reality is that you're still living in this world. And this world is dominated by the pursuit of wealth and possessions. And there's obviously a degree of money and possessions that we need to survive. But the question is, as a follower of Jesus, what do I do about this temptation to continually accumulate more? The first thing is to recognize that money is not the problem. It's the love of money. Paul writes to Timothy and says, the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Money's sort of like a fire. It's very powerful when it's used the right way, but if it's not handled carefully or channeled properly, it can actually kill you. The, the, the word the Bible uses, Jesus often uses, is the word greed. And greed means an excessive desire for more than one needs or deserves, particularly in terms of wealth and possessions. And, and we need to define this because this is a real issue today. Greed can become a real stronghold if we don't recognize it. Greed is, is honestly one of those sins that most of us in the church don't confess on a regular basis. It, it often doesn't come up in our life groups or people often don't come forward for prayer at the end of the service and say, you know what, I have an excessive desire in me for more than I need. I, I check my investments constantly. I'm worried about money constantly. Would you pray for me that I would be content in plenty or in want? You know, we we have to talk about money and greed just as Jesus did in his age because it can really mess up relationships if we're not careful. It can kill unity in a family. It can kill unity in a group of friends. It can even do that in a society as well. Solomon says it this way in Proverbs 28, a greedy man stirs up strife. It creates issues that divide people and divide important relationships. It's also important to put healthy parameters around money because if you're not careful, it can also lead to spiritual emptiness where you you can get a new car or a new house or a new job. Uh, You get promoted but, but it, you know, the, the satisfaction wears off after a few days and, and you realize, wow, I'm more financially independent now, but internally I'm more empty because I'm tempted now to think that I don't need other people and I'm tempted on an even deeper level to, to believe that I don't need God. See, greed is ultimately a spiritual problem and a spiritual problem needs a spiritual solution. So let's see what happens next here in our text. We see that the Spirit has filled them. They're of one heart and one mind. No one claims their possessions are their own. In verse 33, I love this, it says, With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's grace was so powerfully at work 
in them all. Great power and great grace. And it's easy for us to think about greed in relationship to there being such need in the world, right? We're aware of the need and the suffering in the world. But greed is first and foremost an affront to God. The early church's sacrificial generosity was not an end in itself. That if everyone was just radically generous, that all problems in the world will be solved. No, it first and foremost was a response to God's grace. It was a worshipful response. It was an opportunity to witness to others of God's power. See, generosity is to be all about God before it's ever about meeting a specific need. And when material things have lost their grip on your heart and on your mind, then you have more mental space freed up to worship God, to testify about the resurrection and what God is doing in your life. And, and this is not something that you can just do in your own power. But, but as you empty yourself from being distracted by the things of this world, it creates more space in your head and in your heart to receive new spiritual insights, to, see, to receive breakthroughs from God, to receive that peace and that sense of security that we all long for. But there really is fruit to what we see here in the early church. Because they were filled with the Spirit, because they had one heart and one mind, because they continued to testify to the resurrection, because of God's grace that was strong on them, the result, verse 34, which is what we like to jump to, but the result is verse 34, that there were no needy persons among them. It's been said that there's enough for everybody's need, but not for everybody's greed. And the fruit is that that of all this that's happening in the early church is that greed gets rooted out of the early church community. Now notice it doesn't say that there was no longer anybody who was wealthy. It says that there was nobody who was needy. The poor were cared for. The widows, the strangers, the orphans were taken in. And it says that, that, that there was great power. See, we see great power and great grace that leads to great generosity that meets great need. And so they become a model to us today of sacrificial generosity, uncommon generosity, above and beyond generosity. It says in verse 34, from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone who had need. Verse 36, Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold a field he had owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. This is the first time in Acts that we meet Joseph, who the disciples give the nickname uh, Barnabas, uh, which means son of encouragement, because he had the, the gift of encouraging people. And one of the ways that he encouraged people was, was by being generous not only with his money and his possessions, but also with his words. And the author of Acts, Luke, he could have shared many examples of sacrificial generosity, but he he chose Barnabas, and I think it was because of Barnabas' significant leadership role in the church. Luke's going to mention Barnabas 23 times in the book of Acts. He's the one, as we know, who goes on the mission with Paul. And Barnabas demonstrates here that leadership participates in the communal life of sacrificial generosity. That leaders are to serve and lead by example. That they're not to ask the church to do things that they're not willing to do themselves. We, we see that Barnabas literally sells a piece of land. He wasn't forced to do this. He was led by God to do this. It was his joy and his example becomes an encouragement to the believers, that we are to love people, that we are to love God's church more than we are to love our own stuff. You know, generosity is really contagious when it takes uh, root in a community, because the more you're around generous people, the more it encourages you to be generous. And it's actually a really attractive thing. It's what attracted people to the early church and made other people want to be a part of that. And Luke highlights this generosity 
in other books of, of, of uh, other chapters in the book of Acts as well. A couple chapters earlier, it says all the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Now back then, they didn't have a stock market um, or other plate. You know, they didn't have cryptocurrency. Selling property and possessions was their version of selling investments, of selling stored resources. Because if something is being stored and saved and it doesn't have a purpose, your responsibility as a follower of Jesus is to give it a purpose. To, 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 you're, you're saving for a, a future purpose. Or you're reclaiming this possession and you're then giving it a new purpose. Or you're selling that possession in order to invest it in God's kingdom. That's what we learn to do through this. So, so if I have an extra car, that means I figure out a way to start using it or I sell it and share the proceeds. If I have an extra house that's just sitting there, I reclaim it for a purpose. The, the rhythm that we're invited into is that of sacrificial generosity. And, and I want to zero in on this term because I think sacrifice can look different for different people depending on your current revelation of what God has shown you, as well as your current level of giving practically. Uh, Sacrificial is when you trust God to give up something valuable for the sake of something even more valuable. So I sacrifice my time, my money, my energy. I sacrifice my attention, which I don't have an unlimited amount of, in order to accomplish something greater for the glory of God and for the good of others. So sacrifice costs us something. It's painful up front. David said, I will not offer to God that which costs me nothing. I will will not give an offering that's not sacrificial. So I'm not giving God my spare change and my spare time because he's worth more than my leftovers. One of the phrases that we use here in our church is the word tithes and offerings. And so when it comes to our our giving moment each week, what we mean by tithe is giving the first 10% of your income. And we see this in the Bible, starting in the book of Genesis, even before the law is introduced, Abraham gives a tithe to Meshizeldek in Genesis 14. And then we see the Israelites are given the law in Exodus, and they're given clear instructions by God to give the first 10% of their income, which was their their produce and livestock, and they would give that to the Levites to support the temple. The the Bible teaches that that everything ultimately belongs to God, but that first 10% is, is what we give back to God as a response to our worship in him, to the goodness that he has done in our life. So so it's a, a discipline to not only give that percentage, 10%, but to give it first, the beginning of the month, before I know how I'm going to make it through the month. Proverbs 3 says it this way, Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all your crops. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing and your vats will brim over with new wine. You know, this, this theme in the Bible comes up over and over of putting God first, of seeking first the kingdom trusting that then all these things will be added. There's this principle throughout the Bible that you can't outgive God. Malachi 3.10 says, Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, God says. He says, Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be enough room to store it. Now, tithing is something that Amy and I have done throughout our marriage since day one, even when we were poor missionaries in Boston. And even though we have mostly been paid by the church, we have taken God at his word and always given the first fruits of our income, the first 10% each time that we're paid. And it's, it's something that we taught the church here, the district church, to do since day one, since our living room days that we were teaching on tithing. We even did a, a tithe challenge in year two of our church where we challenged the roughly 100 people in the church to tithe for 90 days and see what God does in your life. And so when we say tithe, what we mean is, is, is giving the first 10% of your income that you receive to God's church to advance his mission. 
The tithe is also talked about in the New Testament as well. Jesus refers to the tithe with his disciples. And he critiques the Pharisees who he says, says rightfully are tithing. Rightfully they're giving a tenth of what they earn, uh, what is expected of them. But they do so in a way that neglects the weightier matters of justice and being faithful to God. So he critiques them for having the outward behavior but whose heart is not engaged. And so the tithe we see even throughout the New Testament is the assumption of what believers are doing. And it becomes the floor of New Testament giving. Which leads to the second word we use, which is offerings. We talk about tithes and offerings. Offerings are what we give beyond the 10%. This is when you're led to give beyond um, that 10% and, and give beyond God's church, beyond the local church. Of course, we know everything that we have comes from God, that 100% of what we have comes from God, but the first 10% belongs to God. And so when, when I'm giving beyond the 10%, I'm giving what's called uh, in the Bible oftentimes free will offerings, or we call them special offerings or special initiatives, or we have benevolence funds, or we have Advent offerings to help support our partners, or we do things to help uh, personally help our friends or help our neighbors, or we support missionaries or campus ministers. There's things we do collectively as a church, but there's things that you may do to support those ministries directly as well. A few years ago, Amy and I felt like God was calling us to give more than we had ever given to a charity in this season of the church that we were going through before, um, both from our tithes and our offerings. And when I shared uh, the number with Amy, Amy that I felt like God led me to, I thought she was going to shoot me down and say, how could we possibly do this? But my wife always has more faith than me. Um, And she took it to the Lord in prayer and God gave her a number that was 10% higher than my number, which then led me to have to trust God even more. And and it it was a press for us in many ways. We had to test the Lord in this, as it says in Malachi. But we sense God calling us to take this step of faith. And I'm happy to share three years later that what my dad taught is still true, that you cannot outgive God, that God provided for us spiritually and even practically an unexpected income over the next couple years more than even we gave. God is truly Jehovah Jireh, our provider. He says, test me in this. It's the only place in scripture that God says, test me in this. It's sort of like God's like, let me show off to you in practical ways. And so if you're listening to this and you're like an intern that makes $100 a month and a stipend, God says, test me in this. If you just got your your first real job, God says, test me in this. Just as you're creating your first budget, test me in this. Just as you're getting married and you're learning how to budget together, God says, test me in this. If you've been married for for many years, but you don't have that unity spiritually uh, and and you don't have that unified direction in your life, God says, test me in this. And the reality is that sacrifice is going to look different for each of us depending on where we are. For many of you, if you have not yet learned to tithe, learning to tithe will be very sacrificial. Learning to put God first in your budget requires faith and it will feel tight at first. But I guarantee you, if you start asking people in our church who have experienced financial freedom in their life, they've worked their way out of debt and they've begun to create financial margin in their life, even in one of the most expensive places to live in the world, they've done it by putting God first in their giving. They've learned to tithe. And and that can require some real lifestyle changes which is why it's called sacrificial. That you're saying, I'm not going to make some trips this year that I was going to make. I'm not going to buy some stuff that I was going to buy. I'm not going to uh, get the nicest place to live that I could. Now, for others of you, sacrificial generosity is learning to go beyond the 10% tithe. It's opening yourself up to where is God at work, even beyond my church community? Are, are there needs in my neighborhood uh, that I can meet? I love Frank and Nina O'Neill in our church. They've led the longest running life group in the church, the Married Couples Group. It's been meeting for 13 years here in Brookland near our ministry center. And they embody what we're talking about. I mean, Frank teaches everyone to tithe. And as they experience that joy, he brings them real needs in the community and people give in their life group. I want you guys to check out 
this brief testimony from their group. Hi, I'm Frank O'Neill. And I'm Nina O'Neill, and together we lead the Brooklyn Married Couples Life Group at the District Church. Since we have a married couples group, we definitely have a need to provide meals very often, and so we've done that many, many times. We're very good at meal trains now. One of our mottos is, no one moves alone. So when we know one is moving from either one place in D.C. to another, or they're moving out of town, then we are there. We, are, we show up in number and we do it joyfully. Realizing a need that a couple in our group had of where they were trying to adopt a young girl and they were going through a legal battle in order to have to do that. And so they, they, were, they were experiencing legal fees and counseling fees that were just overwhelming. And one of them in the group came to me and just said, we've got to help them. And so what happened is we raised over two different times about $12,000 to help them with legal fees. And that's where it started. In October of 2021, Amy Graham came to Nina and I and asked us if we would host a young man in our house during his senior year, uh, allowing him to finish up school. When he ended up going to Catholic University this past year, during his freshman year, he got a lot of uh, grants. He got a lot of scholarships, but he still owed about $10,000 at the end of the semester. It was all of us together provided him $10,000 to completely pay his debt. He was overwhelmed. And maybe your group doesn't have a lot of financial largesse or, or abundance but you can always do something else like we have meals we have babysitting you know we do a lot of things that aren't financially uh, motivated it's it can just be service motivated too generosity is something that jesus talked about jesus modeled and he was all about it we want to follow that example we want to be a group that does love think and act like jesus to do that, not just as James says, to say to each other, be warmed and be filled, but we are actually going to do something about it. And we do it because we love Jesus and because we love each other. Amen. Isn't it amazing to be generous with our time and our money and to do that in community with others? This is the Bible, this is New Testament. Christianity. And God has given us one another so that we can spur each other on toward generosity and to also have wisdom in how we give. Because one of the things that happens when sacrificial generosity becomes a true rhythm in your life is that it begins to introduce complications. Because what you will find out is that either you rarely have enough money to meet the need that you encounter in somebody's life, or you might realize that it's not good for you to meet their full need, even if you have the ability. And, and so you're like, you know, you meet somebody and they need a car and it's like a genuine need. And you're like, I can't meet this myself, but our life group comes together. It's like GoFundMe style. And we help provide this car for this family in crisis. And, and you know, there's some situations where, where helping someone actually might create unhealthy dependency. You know, the, the person that might come to your door um, asking for money for medication, and then they start coming every other day, and you don't see that their life is improving, and you start asking the question, am I actually helping them? And you're wondering, what do I do now? That's why God has given us each other, to serve and to give collectively. It says here in our text that those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, and they put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone who had need. The apostles were the leaders of the church. They were the overseers. And, and, and so then why did people lay it at the apostles' feet? It was because the church is to be the most connected institution in society to the needs in their neighborhood or city. 
And the, the church, the cool thing about the church is that we don't just specialize in healthcare needs or education needs or housing needs or disability needs or uh, immigration needs. We, we're about ministering the whole gospel to the whole person. And so if someone needs help in one of those areas and they have a genuine need, we find a way to meet that need. And, and, and you need a process and a team to be able to vet needs and give people dignity in the process because you want to be as generous as possible, but you also want to be as helpful as possible. And so the local church becomes the group that is able to do things like we've done here is set up a benevolence ministry where we receive offerings from the church and then you have needs that come to our attention and, and then you have people in our church who are trained to be patient and kind to be able to speak with that person in need and treat them with dignity as someone who's made in the image of God and to be able to understand their story and un uncover the true nature of their need so that together you can design a solution that will help that individual get to their next step and accomplish their goals in life. And, and it's amazing when that happens in community. Every month and at times every week, we are meeting real needs, starting with our church community through our benevolence ministry, where light bills are paid or, or rent bills are paid or legal fees are paid. Whatever the barrier is, we do our best to meet it. And God always seems to refill our benevolence bucket. And, and it's, it's not just us and our generosity, it's what other organizations do as well. We've sponsored many married couples who are in crisis to be able to go through a marriage intensive to get their marriage back on track. That happens through our benevolence ministry, through the generosity of people in our church. It's why we have local partners as well, because our local partners have a process that they've developed, a proven track record of helping move people out of poverty and into experiencing spiritual wholeness. And today at our church, we have 10 local organizations that are with us for our outreach fair and our connection center after both of our services. Five of those partners are folks we support monthly financially and we send volunteers to. DC 127, the district school, Casa Chirilagua, Christian Legal Aid, um, and Little Lights. And then five of them are, are ones that we send volunteers to regularly. Christ House, Ayuda, Community of Hope, Ward 2 Mutual Aid, and Seabury. And they're each meeting the tangible needs of people in our city on a daily basis. And we have the privilege of coming alongside them and serving them. And, and, and it's, it's, it's incredible. I mean, there's, there's needs in our church and needs in our city that we're not able to meet. But praise God that there's others who we trust, that when we give our time or we give our money, we know that it's actually going to help children and families in crisis, that it's helping foster kids, that it's helping educate this next generation of Christian students, that it's helping serve immigrants in Arlington and Alexandria, that it's helping provide legal representation for those who can't afford it, or tutoring for kids that live in government housing, or providing health care for the homeless, or food and clothing for immigrants who just arrived in D.C. with nowhere to go. We're, we're helping serve the elderly who have nobody to take care of them. And, and praise God that, that there are people who help us learn to be generous but not be foolish, right? Because we want to help in a way that glorifies God but also in a way that helps bring real dignity and transformation to people's lives. My dad taught me that you cannot outgive God. And he didn't just give me a lecture, he embodied it. And in, in the year 2000, he felt called to leave his job, comfortable job at a large church, in order to start a counseling ministry to help serve ministers, shepherd staff ministry. He was tired of seeing pastors burn out of the ministry. And so he started with a conviction that we will never turn a minister away for their inability to pay. 
And he also told me that he wasn't going to fundraise, that he was just going to trust God. And I was a little nervous about this, but I serve as the chair of his board. And I'm happy to say that 24 years later, the bills have always been paid. We've always been able to cover the counselor's fees and we have never turned away a pastor for their inability to pay. We've served now 3,000 ministers. And so because I saw that work, I took the same playbook when we started our counseling ministry here at this church, and I said, we're going to have a model where we pay our counselors because they give their time and they should be paid, but, but the people that come to see us, they should pay what they're able to pay, and we shouldn't turn away anybody who's in need that has the inability to pay. And so even this year, we've served 71 benevolence clients, people that didn't have the ability to pay because of the generosity of people in our church. Remember, Satan does not want the church of Jesus Christ to advance. He doesn't want us to witness. He doesn't want us to be unified. And he doesn't want us to be generous and certainly not sacrificial in our generosity. So he'll send anything our way. He'll send physical persecution. He'll send moral compromise. He'll send an overly analytical mind like the Pharisees. He'll send professional distraction to keep us from being generous. And so as I close today, I want to challenge you to be alert. Jesus said in in Luke 12, be alert and guard your heart from greed and from always wishing for what you don't have. For your life can never be measured by the amount of things that you possess. And so the question is, what parameters is God asking you to put in your life to protect you from greed? What is your next step of obedience look like today? Sacrificial generosity may look like you beginning to to give to your local church regularly. For others of you, it it may look like uh, choosing to trust God with the first 10% of your income, what the Bible calls a tithe. For others of you, it's it's going beyond that 10% and being radically generous Um, as we approach this year end over these next few months. Where is God calling you to step in and meet the spiritual and social needs of those around you? One of my favorite verses, which really challenges us to have a, a lifestyle of simplicity. It says in Proverbs 30, Give me neither poverty nor riches, but give me only my daily bread. Otherwise, I may have too much and disown you and say, Who's the Lord? Or I might become poor and steal, and so dishonor the name of my God. Let's pray together. Jesus, we thank you for teaching us, even in the Lord's Prayer, to give us this day our daily bread. God, I thank you for providing for our every needs, just like you you care for the lilies of the valley and the birds of the air. God, you care for us. You're concerned about what we're concerned about. God, Father, forgive us when we allow the spirit of greed to tempt us internally to pursue things that we don't need to impress other people that we don't need to impress. God, teach us the secret, as Paul says in Philippians, of being content, whatever our circumstances. Help us to trust you that if we put you first in all areas of our life, including with our giving, that you will provide according to your riches and glory. So help us, God, as a church to continue to step out in faith and to be generous corporately as a church, to always give the first 10% of what we receive as a church to the needs of our community. But help us to apply this in our personal lives as well. We thank you. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Love you guys. Thank you so much for joining us for District Church Online. We would love to hear from you so that we can pray for you, connect you to our community life through one of our life groups in Northern Virginia, Maryland, or D.C., or give you more information about our in-person Sunday morning services in Columbia Heights in D.C. Also, if you haven't subscribed yet and turned on notifications, we encourage you to do so right now so you don't miss a beat with what's going on online with the District Church. Now, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all forever. Amen.